Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 14 of uh, the series, What's a Library? What is a library if the building is closed? Uh, we started this in late March in response to what was clearly a, a global crisis and have been uh, focusing on various aspects of that question uh, ever since. Now, you know, in this 14th session, looking at um, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure as various attributes or aspects related to that question of what is a library now. And, and in the future, I guess we can, uh, uh, we can presume that that is going to be the case. <clears throat> Let me get a slide going up here of uh, our round two. Uh, last time we, time before last, we initiated what we're calling libraries in response, which is uh, uh, the action that libraries are taking to deal with the crisis, with the needs of their patrons and communities. Uh, today, we're, we'll discuss, uh, we have two great speakers who will discuss uh, the, the K-20 Connectivity Challenge, kindergarten through, through postgraduate and reinventing school. Uh, our session is hosted by the International Federation of Library Associ Associations and Institutions. IFLA, IFLA.org, IFLA.org, and our media co-host is Broadband Breakfast, who has been uh, very helpful in, in helping us spread the word on that. Um, I showed this slide last week. Uh, this graph is, uh, probably most people have seen it by now, of the, uh, the trends in, in the infection rates. Uh, and it, you know, it doesn't look that good. Here you see the U.S. had a a full two-week lead on, on the European Union in terms of responding and preparing, and they both peaked at about the same level uh, and the same about two weeks apart. But after that, it's been markedly different. Uh, it looked like things were going down. The U.S. started loosening up. European Union pretty held, held, the, held the line on uh, distancing and masks and testing and the rest of it and we frankly have not so this is uh, you know our things looking up it's a uh, it's a kind of an ironic statement uh and yes indeed they are looking up uh unfortunately they're looking up we've just passed the peak infection rate uh peak infection level uh that we experienced in late march when everybody kind of understood this was a real thing and so where's it going from here? We've got runaway uh, infection rates in, in some places in the US. Arizona's at the top of the news, but Texas, Florida, California, where I am, we're all seeing uh, major uh, increases, expectations of filling up beds, uh, ICU beds uh, in the next couple of months, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of weeks, uh, with no real solution in sight. So. The, the idea that we may have had, and I confess to sharing some of that, uh, that uh, we were kind of over the hump and, you know, we're going to kind of hold on, get under control, vaccine to be along, and, you know, it won't totally be back to exactly normal, but it'll be close to normal. Well, I think that's off the table, if I can venture editorial opinion on that. Um, to the point today, you know, 21%, one in five students, don't have reliable broadband count, uh, uh, access at home. This is the uh, 4-H council put this out uh, about a week or two ago. Uh, it, it poses a very serious question about what is school if 20% uh, of the students are not participating and school is only really done online. Uh, we have the technology, this, this slide I used uh, before, it's uh, a super high-tech yacht, uh, 200 feet long and about that high, one person can sail this, this uh, technology marvel in the backdrop of a fire on Angel Island, which is in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. This is about 10 years ago. 
uh, kind of as a metaphor for uh, an out of control, well, pick your, <laughs> pick your crisis that's out of control, and yet uh, the, the technology has never been so more sophisticated. Can we apply that to these crises and, and as solutions? Uh, great speakers today. Louis Fox, CEO of Scenic, uh, is with us from Idaho remotely. He has a, a weak connection up there, endemic of the, uh, the circumstances we're all dealing with, uh, how we can have a robust infrastructure so that everybody everywhere can connect. Uh, it's ironic that Lewis, uh, uh, running a, a high-performance network uh, company in California, the Research and Education Network, Scenic, uh, is currently in Idaho and is on by telephone. He has his partner, Kyle, is going to run his slides for him. But first, we're going to hear from uh, Howard Blumenthal, the executive uh, co-executive producer of Reinventing School, which I highly recommend. I was on a session yesterday. Uh, they were talking about uh, uh, the various experiences that people are going through and, and notably homeschooling, which, you know, we thought, oh, okay, well, a number of people are doing that. It's on the rise. It's popular. It's, a no, uh, it's roughly the same number of people that are homeschooling that are in charter schools. It's around 10% of the K-12 population. Well, now it's closer to 100% of the population. And what they've learned uh, will be uh, of interest, I think, to everybody as they, they've been families at home learning together over the years. Um, this is the question I just set up. Uh, uh, our return commitment here phrase is assuring access to public information is an essential service, ever more so in this circumstance where people cannot really get out well, to, you know, where can you go into a, a public office and get information these days? Uh, it has to be pretty much online. And uh, well, that's what libraries do is provide information and they really do it better than anybody else. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, an open collaboration of uh, innovation libraries, as we say, cooperating and working on various kinds of, uh, of projects as a, as a test bed and showcase. Uh, notably in relation to uh, using wireless technologies to extend access to library services, library digital services, the most popular of which, of course, is the internet, but not only, all the, all the various digital materials that, that all of you provide as uh, libraries, which are increasing by factors of one, two, three times uh, or the new demand as people are looking for alternatives for commercial products and things to do at home. Uh, last week, we kicked off the uh, Libraries and Responses wireless thread, talking about uh, different strategies and different spectrum uh, resources that are available for libraries to use, libraries to partner with schools, notably, because this is the number one, number one challenge is how do we have school? If we can't have school, how do we even really have society? And, uh, and so we'll continue on that. We'll touch on it today. Lewis is going to uh, uh, talk about some various wireless strategies that Scenic is using and partners to reach more, uh, more people and more libraries. Uh, we will get further into this next week and the coming weeks we'll deal with the various, various individual uh, spectrum resources that were highlighted last week by Michael Calabrese of the New America Foundation Open Technology Institute. He a a wonderful high level view of these various resources, which are, uh, they're just sitting there waiting for us to use. There's, most of this spectrum is free. We have to buy the equipment, we have to set it up, but there's no fees or no third parties. This is a really interesting approach and we'll get into that more later. later. Uh, these are the various uh, flavors of this, this alphabet soup of, uh, of uh, frequencies. I apologize for that, but this is really valuable knowledge. This is the, even, even as a consumer, even as a, a purchaser of services, it's good and helpful and valuable if you understand the underlying technologies even a little bit. What do you have in your community is kind of the key question. What, these don't exist in the same way every place. The, the license areas, the topology, all these change the, the reality of your own uh, local circumstance. <laughs> but doing an inventory of those is extremely valuable and we're recommending you should we should undertake that evaluation right now. So let's get to it. Um, 
We're going to ask uh, Howard to come on first, and Lewis, uh, there, the one on the left, as we note, uh, will follow. Uh, sorry about that, Lewis. You just set me up sending that photo. So, Howard, uh, you're on. Take it away. Uh, uh, Howard has, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, hosting these reinvent the school uh, sessions are on a weekly basis. They're now done eight or so, I believe. And yes, yesterday was an excellent one. Lewis, if you'd like to, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Lewis. Uh, you're in Montana, not in Idaho. That's that's probably a big insult up there. Uh, but Howard, uh, if you would post that link whenever you can, that'd be great. It was an excellent session. I recommend people tuning into these uh, and signing up for it. Okay, Howard Blumenthal, who is the co-executor uh, of that series. He is also the creator of uh, uh, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? You of a certain age may remember that. Uh, probably most everybody at this point. And also, uh, I think it's uh, Kids and Learning. Um, you can talk a little more of that, Howard. I, I'll be happy. I, I'll, I don't want to botch your introduction any further than I have. So please welcome and take it away. So yeah, thank you very much. And hi, everybody. Um, so and I hope everybody is getting through this crazy time uh, in the best possible way and in the safest possible way. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of background and I'll connect some of the dots and then we'll talk a little bit about um, a few different projects and very specifically um, we'll talk about reinventing school and uh, and also a project called Kids on Earth which is what you were reaching for. Um, so off we go. Um, background, I come from the world of television but I've always been very involved in books, other media, learning, uh, typically on a national and now on a global level, which is great fun. I'm a senior scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, so I have my academic credential, which is helpful in the United States. In other countries, people aren't necessarily clear on what Pennsylvania is, but that's okay. Um, I, and I've been having a great time lecturing uh, all around the world, and um, this is sort of the functional equivalent of that right now, if you will. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of screen sharing just to give you a couple of video images that will help you. Um, every week, we produce a new episode of Reinventing School. Yesterday, we talked about home is a place for learning. Uh, Pat Ferenga continues the work of John Holt. Um, uh, Doug Fine lives very much off the grid, but he's an old NPR reporter. Um, Diana Burns is very involved in um, uh, redesign of physical schools. But before that, we did Hope, which was great fun, um, and uh, uh, College Behind Bars. We worked with the people at the Ken Burns Florentine Films on that. Um, All right, bring it here. What is that? <laughs> Okay, and uh, and the, the earlier episodes, which you can see on the website, are what about my job security at school, and we go all the way back to our first episode, all of them are here to be watched, and Randy Weingarten, who runs the um, American Federation of Teachers, was our first guest. So that's been a really wonderful opportunity for me and for people who watch to get a sense of where are we really in terms of reopening schools, how will things look? at home, what is the role of parents, what's the role of teachers, we're deep diving into this. Next week we're dealing with faith and charity, um, and both of those words have a, have a bunch of different meanings, so I'll tease you on that, but it's www.reinventing.school. So that's one piece. Um, the second piece, let me just do this, yeah, um, is Reinventing School came about, and now I'll go way back to uh, a project I did called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego that was a big hit for PBS that I created or co-created and produced. Um, this is in the first half of the 90s, but it was a time when we were starting to learn how to use television beyond what Sesame Street had done. Um, it was a time when video games and the like were just beginning to become really popular. Computers were showing up in people's houses. So it was a very new and very different time. It gave us a lot of license to experiment with what television could do. Um, 
and we won you know just about every award you could win it was really kind of a great show and you can see that on um, on youtube there are still some episodes floating around for me i carried a, an atlas in my briefcase a portable atlas smaller uh, everywhere i went for those five years and really tried hard to understand how kids learn about the world and one of my great frustrations during that period was there really wasn't any way to talk to kids all over the world but by 2017 there was so i started traveling the world and talking to kids and that became i'll share screen again for you um a project called kids on earth so the url is there and i'll show you the two so it's www.kidsonearth.org and um and vimeo I'll show you what is there in a second. I guess I have to stop share, then share screen again to show you the assets. Okay, and let me go over here and let me get out of this. Sorry, it's not the most elegant interface, but here's the homepage for Kids on Earth. And you can see that it features a few kids one on one conversations, plus a lot of information about many of the places that I've been. And this is a free service, we'll talk about that in a second, um, for, that is used throughout the world. It's used in about 80 different countries. It that I'm talking about, that's the sort of lead page, but here's what the, um, the library looks like. There are over 800 individual short form interviews with kids in, in Chile, in New Jersey, in New Delhi, India, in Kosovo, in um in philadelphia in brazil um and for me this has been an absolute joy being able to go and just have conversations in classrooms often in the school library um with kids and and talk about what's your life how do you think about the future and then important and relevant for this conversation is how do you learn what do you know about the way you learn what do you know about the way that all of this works and where are you heading and even with a nine or ten year old i'm finding very clear answers they tend to really like school they tend to really like books they tend to use libraries um, they tend not to talk so much about video games and they accept the idea that you have to be very safe and careful on the internet and that you have to filter the information that's coming to you so the idea that we have an unsophisticated, unwashed mass of kids around the world who have to be taught every day about internet safety and the like, yeah, this, you have to do some of that. But the kids are so much more sophisticated than I think we've given any, any of them credit for. Um, so the collection of Kids on Earth videos, I continue to edit. I still have about 100, 150 to do from the trips that I've taken so far. India was the most recent. They're, they have a good sense of the space program. They, have an, they can argue the ethics of colonizing another planet uh, because we've done such a bad job in managing the environment of Earth. They will argue about the role of robots and robot safety, but they will consider the idea that a robot may at some point marry their grandson. Um, there's so many um, opportunities to listen to kids and to engage their imagination one-on-one. -on -one. And in fact, one of the things that I would like to be able to do with you guys, I see a lot of names on the screen, not a lot of faces right now, um, is I'd like to be able to set up Zoom interviews with individual kids in the many places where you guys are located. I do the interviews one-on-one. -on -one. Um, these are arrangements that we can put together relatively easily. And I typically, I just recently worked with, uh, uh, a school outside Eureka, California. I'm on the East Coast. And we did three or four interviews and they were lovely and consistently surprising. So every place I go, I typically would travel, eat nicely, and then interview kids. Eating nicely now happens at home because um, we don't have as many options, but there's no reason why I can't con continue to do this. I typically work with a school, but working within a library program also makes a lot of sense. So I've had the opportunity to travel to a lot of different kinds of schools, some libraries, in many different places in the world. And I ask a lot of questions because I'm curious. And what I found is that even, so I'll, I'll, are any of you, if you are, just chat me, are any of you in Eastern Kentucky? Um, if you are, you may know about something called Apple Shop, A-P-P-A-L, 
Apple shop, like Apple Appalachian Mountains. So um, they have a wonderful library in the town of Fleming Neon, which if you know your Robert F. Kennedy history was one of the places that he had traveled in coal mining country. And the library and the fire department are the pride of a town that has fallen apart. There, the opioid crisis has taken things in a very bad direction. Um, and many of the storefronts are now very small churches. The kids are thriving. They have a school, they have a library, they have a fire department. The fire department is a place where events are held. And the, the amount of happiness and joy in being a community is so evident. And it comes to, uh, it, it really shines in the school and in the library. You're all familiar with the phenomenon of the library is closed, but it's the place where you can get the internet. So everybody puts up chairs outside the facility all day and night. Um, they've really embraced that. And they had been doing that well before the pandemic. It became more and more clear to me when I started looking at what was happening in Eastern Kentucky and what was happening in uh, Buenos Aires, um, in, um, uh, no, I'm not, no, it's in Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, um, with community centers, particularly a Buddhist community center uh, that is adjacent to what turns out to be the, I think, the second largest Japanese population in the world, which is in Sao Paulo. Um, these community centers combine libraries, senior centers, other services, and people just hang out there. So it's wonderful to see just how much energy the community possesses and how freely it's shared between all of these different demographic groups. It's really, really fun to see just how vibrant a community can be and how exciting the library can be as the center of that. Let me connect a few more dots. In, uh, on Long Island, um, in New York, and in some other places, they have something like an old Chautauqua, an old traveling, Traveling Chautauqua, I'm gonna put a little bit more light on for you. Um, that's a little better. Um, and it, the idea is that there is a singer who um, sings old Yiddish theater songs, picking something very specific. Uh, and that person appears in a theater that's part of one library, is uh, then appears like the next day in another library in a somewhat different venue, then outside the library because they have a lawn in another library. And it becomes a circuit. And I think that's a really brilliant idea. I know it's being done to some, you know, to some extent, but the idea of connecting libraries as community centers, I know is something you guys have discussed. I'm sure it has. But the idea of creating a central place where, where everybody is encouraged to come to just be a community uh, is really magical. And I think we're learning the importance of one-on-one -on -one conversations and lots of people getting together because they're interested in a particular topic. These can go pretty deep. And because we now know we can do a whole lot of stuff online, the combination of doing an event and uh, online and local is pretty appealing for me as a speaker, because I go out and do a lot of speeches, um, being able to go to an area and knock off five of them because everybody has coordinated increases the likelihood that I will go to Eastern Kentucky because one single library may not be able to afford to do it or may not be able to put it together. But if it's a group of libraries, that's really interesting. So just to review a few different points. One, the Kids on Earth Library, well, first we'll start with Reinventing School. Reinventing School, we do a new episode every Thursday at four o'clock live. And then you can always find a few days later the edited and titled version of that uh, episode on the website, www.reinventing.school. Kids on Earth is a free library, a free library, a free collection. I'm using, I gotta be careful how I use my words here. Um, of almost a thousand short form videos recorded by me, interviews done by me all around the world. It's a continuing effort. And I would encourage you, and I'm happy to talk to you individually about this, about putting together a program that encourages local viewership by kids and by parents as part of an in-home learning uh, activity that is done 
somewhat interactively because the kids who watch may end up being the kids we interviewed the following week. And if we can figure out a way to do some coordinating on that, that would be great fun. Um, the third piece is reinventing the notion, the idea, the concept of what a community is around a library, around scouting, around other activities that already exist and using those to increase the engagement of adults, increase the engagement of seniors, broaden the activities by connecting one library to another, both online and in local space. Uh, and then let me add one other. A lot of kids have no place to go during the day. Home is just not a tolerable place to be. It's also not a safe place to be for too many kids. And it may or may not have connectivity. One in five people here don't have connectivity uh, in the United States, but when you go outside the US, uh, some of the numbers are, are considerably better, but some are considerably worse. We're about average. We're a little better than average, but we're not a lot better than average. So figuring out ways to connect kids in one place where kids and seniors in one place with people in other places, uh, I think is a marvelous idea. And I think it's something libraries probably should start thinking about facilitating in very small groups. One-on-one -on -one with kids is a little tricky. One-on-one -on -one with adults isn't. Every week, I'm on the, the past few days, I've been on the phone with the Philippines or, or Zoom with the Philippines, with um, Brazil. In fact, I did an interview similar to this, a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, in Sao Paulo this week. Um, Malaysia, it just goes on. And it's so wonderful to be able to have the conversation with somebody saying, so how is it going? And then hearing back, well, we're in Brazil, so we're even in worse shape than you guys are in the U.S. because we have leadership that's even more disconnected uh, than your situation. It's great to be able to talk to people in England. It's great to be, talk to people in different parts of Europe because we all, as a uh, now as a human race, are in this together, and we need to understand what that means. It's not okay to put a poster up saying, well, you know, we're all in this together. That's a certain amount of nonsense. I think that being able to actually have a conversation across to, to South Korea or to Indonesia and so many other places and doing that on a routine, regular basis, facilitated by libraries, um, I think could be a tremendously potent way of gaining greater relevance, encouraging um, a lot more um, uh, prospecting through the library collection and, and resources to find out what if this is available, what else is available. Um, and doing the connections because library in Brussels, Belgium has a lot in common with library in Mexico City. And I think we've kind of missed that step. I'm hoping that by working with kids on earth and reinventing school, we can build some of those bridges. So I'm happy to answer questions, Don. I'm not sure how you would like to do this, whether you want to have the other speaker speak first and then we'll do questions or whether you want to do questions now. Um, and uh, I, you have the URLs. Let me just post the URL for Kids on Earth so you have it. Um, and thank you. Uh, excellent, Howard. Uh, and you remind me that I was remiss in uh, setting this up. Uh, uh, you know, we are primarily U.S. Uh, participants, but the, the focus here is, is international or is, is not only U.S. based. We have had presentations from, uh, uh, from Ireland, from Denmark, France, uh, and Ghana uh, as well. So your point about libraries having similar experiences everywhere is, is pretty much on the mark. That's what we've heard. Uh, even as we've heard in European circumstances that they were, you know, preparing to reopen a little earlier. I love your point about community centers. Um, we, we use library just as a, as a shorthand for, for that. I mean, they certainly are community centers, if not the heart and hub of a community, but they're not the only type of a community center. The, the work that we've done with uh, IFLA has been around the, well, we formed the Partnership for Public Access uh, with uh, IFLA, with the Internet Society, with IEEE and some others, with the, the basic mission uh, of providing or assuring universal public access 
It basically means that everyone should be within at least walking distance of some kind of access point to engage uh, the internet and, and the world's digital materials. Uh, and that, so that's been a lot of work going on and I appreciate your invitation to do some interviews. Uh, you've put up uh, your email address. I would encourage everybody there, everybody who's interested in, in discussing this with Howard to, uh, to engage him on that. And uh, I'll follow up directly with Howard and we can brainstorm on ways to spread that word out and we'll certainly do it as a follow up on the, on the notes here. So you, you, you touch on a ton of interesting points. Um, and uh, one of which was, uh, you know, this number of students who are, who are not connected. And yet, you know, how do we do school? Is school possible now? I mean, today, I don't mean today, but next month or practically next month, the school starts in August. Are we going to be able to really start school or is it just an open question or how are we oh, going to do it? It's not, it's not an open question, if I can jump in. We are going to have school for a brief period during the last quarter of the year, maybe starting in September. School, there will then be a problem because some schools will have some infections. We'll start locally saying, oh, that's a problem. And then that will very quickly gain attention. Um, and I would think by October, schools will be closed. Uh, there'll be a little bit of maybe we could open locally, and then we will all be completely distracted by the U.S. presidential election, which probably will not go smoothly. Um, and we'll all spend most of November and December talking not about schools or libraries, but instead we'll be talking about who's going to be the president. By January, hopefully that will get resolved. And in the meantime, that poor fifth grader is going, so what am I exactly am I supposed to be doing here while the adults are off worrying about their latest adventure? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think probably by next April, a year from now, we start seeing the clouds clear some. This is going to be a long haul. I'm talking to public health experts all the time about this. This is not something that we're going to solve quickly. It's something we need to build long-term plans for. And as people who have, uh, a strong interest in libraries and learning, I think you need to step up. I think you, you have a much bigger role and I think you have to increase your profile or you, amplify your profile. That's great. Uh, we have heard that, uh, that libraries are stepping up, uh, of course, to support, you know, anybody's sort of demands for, for online resources, but particularly it seems that parents have sought help from libraries and how they can be more effective coaches or or advocates for learning in their in their household uh that seems like a big one if if we're going to have to kind of surge forward and pull back and you know we're going to have to at least have a model for home learning uh, i don't know that that's the solution sorry and the ahead. reason i don't is it, we're in the middle of an economic crisis the crisis will get worse a lot worse as this wave of, of benefits from the government fades away. And parents, they, I mean, there's, there's no functional logic behind kids will go to school Mondays, Wednesdays, and others will go to school Tuesdays, Thursdays. We don't have enough teachers to support both distance learning and classroom learning. And we don't have any means to recruit enough teachers to be able to fill those gaps. We also haven't figured out how to pay for any of that as we're doing school cuts. So that's not a functional solution nor is distance learning until you're at a point where you can, you're mature enough as a kid to be able to handle that. A first grader doing distance learning for more than two half hours a day is a little silly. Um, so you can do school for two or three hours a day. And as we were talking about yesterday with homeschooling on the reinventing school episode, you absolutely could do school the effective the important stuff in two or three hours a day and then give the kids the freedom to pursue their own curiosities that's great but as parents we have to stop helicoptering if we're going to do that that's a big adjustment particularly when the kids aren't quite allowed to go outside or interact with other people this requires a lot more conversation it requires a lot more thought and unfortunately we're focused on reopening as opposed to focusing on how do we handle the reality that we are not going to be reopening for an extended period? We have to figure out ways to do this within small communities. And if we don't, 
we're going to have two years, I'm guessing, maybe two and a half years of kids who are not getting a formal education, at which point testing and evaluation falls apart. We have to rejigger state funding. We have a lot of work to do to rethink what this system looks like. And that's part of what I'm learning and part of what I'm espousing in doing reinventing school. And this is not a local problem, but it's very much of a U.S. and Brazil, which has some similarities issue, because we, don't have, we haven't thought it through. We don't have the leadership. We don't organize school the way they do in Europe or in South Korea or other places. So I'll be quiet now, but uh, you, you kind of wound me no, up. No, that's, 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 that's a great summary. Uh, we both don't know how to do this, and we can't not do this. Uh, so somehow, if uh, American ingenuity is what it's cracked up to be, it's going to really be called into play here. Uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, I'm going to now look to uh, Lewis Fox, the CEO of Scenic, to uh, make a presentation remotely from the state of Montana, not California, where he normally is and works, well, I guess. I don't know where you work now, uh, Lewis. Uh, uh, all right, thank you. Uh, Scenic is the California Research and Education Network. Uh, uh, most states have their own research and education network. These were built originally to connect the universities, originally the research universities, and have expanded out to, to provide connectivity to all the higher ed and K-12 and libraries and clinics and so forth, and uh, play a, a central role in the connectivity solution for our anchor institutions in the U.S. And Lewis, we're lucky to have you today and, and happy, uh, even uh, telephonically with the support uh, from Kyle there in your office to advance your slides. So, Lewis Fox, take it away. Thank you, Don, uh, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as as, as uh, uh, Don said, um, Scenic is uh, one of a number of research and education networks, and not just in the U.S., but uh, um, throughout the world. There's an, uh, uh, an ecology of regional, national, and uh, international networks that uh, connect research and education. I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes telling you about Scenic and then, and then we'll sort of move into talking about um, libraries, the role of libraries uh, in, uh, at this current uh, historic moment and um, also uh, some of our thinking about uh, uh, access, uh, broadband equity, uh, and some of the work we're doing there. Uh, Scenic was founded uh, 23 years ago um, by its members, who we call Charter Associates, and uh, the slide shows that it's basically all of education in California. Um, those communities govern um, Scenic. They, uh, it's a little bit like Noah's Ark, the senior person at, say, the University of California, Janet Napolitano, appoints three people to the board, uh, as does Tim White at Cal State, and so on. It's a, it's a sort of Noah's Ark model, except they come three by three instead of two by two. Um, we run um, a physical network, uh, about 8,000 miles of uh, long haul fiber in, uh, in California. We have members in, in every county in, in California. About 12,000 institutions connect to uh, the scenic network. And we are uh, indeed um, a not-for-profit uh, 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 organization. And there's a map of the backbone. Next slide, please, Kale. Next slide. Um, I, I'd also note that we have um, uh, a physical infrastructure uh, that extends well beyond uh, California. Um, we uh, partner with uh, uh, states uh, in the West uh, to create a, a, a physical infrastructure uh, for research. We also run uh, an interconnection fabric uh, for the Asia Pacific region um, so that uh, any of the uh, networks that come ashore on the West Coast of the United States uh, uh, interconnect with us and then uh, uh, we then connect them to other national and regional networks in the United States and with partners um, uh, in Chicago, and you'll see in a subsequent slide in Washington, D.C. and, uh, 
and uh, New York, we uh, connect to uh, networks uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, in South America, and uh, in Africa. Next slide, please, Gail. Um, I, I'll note, too, that the, the networks that we run are, are multiple. We have a, a, a sort of fabric for research. We have something that we call the, the Digital California layer, which uh, supports uh, largely community colleges, K-12 schools, and libraries. And we have uh, also an experimental platform that uh, allows uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, astronomers, physicists, and so on to uh, experiment with new, new network protocols and uh, and, and so on without uh, uh, breaking our production network. Um, we have uh, this, this interesting uh, mission that at uh, once is to uh, uh, make sure that um, the great research community that we have in California uh, is pre-positioned to continue to be successful. So we tend to be on the leading edge uh, of, uh, of network technology um, and uh, uh, in order in order to assure that those researchers have access to global scale instruments, to massive data sets, uh, to other partners uh, in the United States and around the globe. But we also focus on um, uh, issues of digital equity. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the leading edge focus of our mission often redounds to the benefit of the uh, equity mission. Uh, and we're able to uh, push out uh, newer technologies uh, much sooner and in ways that are much less expensive than uh, communities might be able to uh, otherwise afford. About uh, uh, six years ago, we started an initiative to include all of California's uh, 1,200 public libraries on the network. And, uh, and as a part of our, our governance structure as well, um, we have in California about 180 library jurisdictions that are, that are eligible to participate. We have about 160 of them now connected um, or in the process of being connected. I think there are nine or 10 that we're in the process of connecting. Behind them, of course, are these uh, thousand public libraries. Um, we've worked really closely um, with the California State Le uh, Legislature to get um, uh, the least well-connected schools in California uh, connected to our network. Um, they typically connect to us via carrier circuits. Um, our research universities are directly connected um, with our fiber, um, although increasingly we're seeing some of the larger school districts uh, connect to us with dark fiber connections. Um, these schools, though, the, the ones that are part of the Broadband Improvement Grant Program, are often in far-flung rural areas. And many people uh, who, when they think about California, they think about California as an urban state because they've been to uh, San Francisco or uh, Los Angeles or San Diego. But uh, we have uh, uh, just about every kind of, of, uh, of geography. And we have many far-flung rural areas in the mountains and the deserts uh, up along the coast uh, in Northern California and so on. And, and there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, terrestrial infrastructure in many of these places. And so we've been working hard to figure out uh, modes of connecting not just, school, not just schools in those regions, but um, uh, also uh, uh, libraries. And in some instances, we've been able to do enough aggregation of community anchor institutions to make it attractive to carriers to uh, build out the necessary, uh, what we call middle mile infrastructure, which gets them um, to the, the uh, urban centers and connects them to the global internet, uh, and as well as bu building the last mile uh, infrastructure. Um, where we haven't been able to get terrestrial infrastructure, we have been increasingly relying on uh, fixed wireless. Uh, and that has turned out to be uh, uh, a real boon to uh, a lot of communities. We, um, 
we were skeptical, I think, originally about uh, about radio technologies um, because uh, typically we ask for symmetrical connections to uh, uh, institutions because they are um, not just passive consumers of content, but they actually create content. And um, and we have now I have now become a believer in some of these radio technologies because they're actually quite good. We have managed to get a gigabit or uh, all the way up to 10 gigabit symmetrical connections to uh, uh, many of the, these communities who at best had uh, uh, dial up uh, or satellite. Uh, and so they are now uh, uh, advantaged in ways uh, uh, that they weren't previously. Um, in a moment, I'll talk a little bit about what this means for, for um, uh, folks at home. But right now I'm focusing on the community anchor institutions. Um, I should note also that we, we, we connect many large medical centers um, and their referring institutions. And so when we go into communities, we're also thinking about uh, increasingly about healthcare. Um, the past year, we were able to partner um, with uh, Google, um, uh, with uh, you know, one of the titans of the internet, Vint Cerf, and um, AT&T to connect uh, 20 tribes uh, in Southern California called the Tribal Digital Village um, and their um, uh, community anchor institutions to our network as a, as a part of an initiative to, we hope one day, connect uh, all 115 uh, 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 tribal uh, communities or rancherias in California uh, to, to our backbone network and hopefully working with um, sister organizations across the West, uh, the other tribes uh, in the Western United States. Um, we've done, uh, the Tribal Digital Village actually um, operates uh, on a fixed wireless system um, and we use a, a fiber link from that fixed wireless system uh, to connect them uh, uh, currently in the, in the, in the, in the, in the southwest to San Diego, and soon uh, in the northeast, they'll connect to uh, one of the uh, northern hey, nodes uh, on our network. How much time left? There's twelve. So next, next slide, please. Um, so what happened during the pandemic? Uh, you know, there was a, a sort of belief that, well, these research and education networks would somehow go dark. Well, <laughs> it, it, it turns out that isn't the case. Um, there are um, lots of folks who are uh, from those institutions uh, 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 getting access to resources at their institutions. Um, and there's a lot of data there, and I have a, a, I have a lot more uh, data if anybody's interested. But we saw libraries uh, continue at about 25% of the previous year's use, which means that the resources that, um, the digital resources that libraries have are uh, exceedingly important to uh, uh, library patrons. And many libraries, as you know, have kept their wireless systems. Uh, and so uh, uh, folks, uh, are driving up to the libraries, uh, hopefully uh, keeping uh, the necessary social distance and accessing the internet um, at libraries when they don't have the, uh, the internet at home. And so that's been a very heavy use. Um, I mean, there's been an extraordinary uptick in use uh, in our medical communities who are uh, at, at or above uh, historical norms because of the uh, number of uh, remote interactions that they now have with ambulatory patients. Um, you know, some went from dozens of, of say, uh, Zoom uh, consultations a week to 10,000, uh, you know, in a month. So they pivoted very quickly to this. And uh, it turns out that um, this is, this is um, also quite popular. Uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, patients that are served by these healthcare facilities, and will likely continue uh, to be a feature of uh, healthcare, um, regardless of uh, uh, when this particular contagion is uh, that contagion is under control. Next slide, please. Um, 
I, I did want to note, you know, the internet is a network of networks. And we, we as, as a fairly large network on the network, we talk to other ones. And it's not just the research and education networks. We also interconnect with the commercial internet. And so when you have uh, a crisis like this, um, we are often talking to one another about how we can share traffic, who has a, a, a access on their network. And so you'll find that this uh, uh, private world of research and education networks is working uh, hand in glove with the commercial internet. And so a lot of what we did was to incre you know, increase the capacity on, uh, on, on the kinds of applications that we were seeing that were heavily used, um, like interactive video, um, but also uh, uh, thinking about how we increase the capacity between um, our network and networks like Time Warner, Charter, Comcast, Co uh, Cox, and so on. So there has been um, uh, a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, among uh, all sorts of networks, both those that are not-for-profits and those that are, are for-profit networks. Uh, during the past three months. Next slide, please. I just wanted to note that um, this global set of networks um, that also now includes um, uh, uh, connectivity um, to uh, Africa uh, as well as the uh, rest of the continents, our, our connectivity to uh, the Antarctic is probably the weakest link in the, in the chain for, for obvious reasons. Um, but the libraries who are part of our network have access to this global ecology of research and education networks, the individuals who are on those networks, the resources that are on those networks. And I think um, we've, we've barely scratched the surface of what's possible um, with libraries sort of as the pivotal member of, uh, of these uh, broad uh, uh, education uh, communities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to note that um, from our uh, left coast perspective, oh, you skipped over. Um, th there is a tremendous amount of activity uh, in, the Pacific, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, of internetworking, and uh, increasingly, uh, most uh, and pretty soon all of those islands will have connectivity to the community anchor institutions, and increasing uh, uh, commercial activity, uh, getting to uh, homes and businesses in those communities. The next couple of slides um, show some of the work that we're doing on um, uh, remote sensing. Uh, for disasters, these are focused on uh, 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 remote sensing of, of fire, but there's work on uh, earthquake and tsunami and lands, landslides and so on, using the same fixed wireless infrastructure that I was talking about before, connecting that data to researchers, not just in California, but around the globe, and ultimately um, uh, to individuals in their homes and libraries. Uh, who want uh, up to the minute um, data about what's going on uh, in their communities. Next slide, please. Another couple of minutes, Lewis. Okay. Next slide, Kale. Yeah. Next one. And next one, one after that. I'll leave this behind as, a, as a, an artifact. Uh, we're working on a, a plan to basically blanket the state of California with this fixed wireless infrastructure that will have uses for uh, uh, all of the uh, emergency situations that I was talking about, but ultimately we'll be able to use the infrastructure to reach uh, people in their community anchor institutions and in their homes and businesses. Next slide. Lastly, um, I just wanted to note um, that uh, we connect a lot of cultural institutions. Um, uh, arts institutions like the Getty, uh, scientific institutions like the California Academy of Sciences and the Exploratorium, and uh, performing arts institutions like uh, SF Jazz, which uh, is the first freestanding uh, facility built for, 
for jazz. And SF Jazz has a huge education com uh, commitment and is especially committed to, to making sure that those communities from where the medium came have access to it. And so libraries have been uh, important venues for uh, uh, community members, uh, uh, school kids to come and to listen to live performances from, uh, from SF Jazz uh, uh, in San Francisco. And that's been a very successful program. Similarly, uh, the California Academy of Sciences, uh, particularly uh, the Planetarium, um, the Exploratorium, have been seeing libraries as a great intermediary for their programs um, around California. But many of these institutions also uh, have not just a national, but an international reach. And so are interested in engaging uh, libraries much more broadly uh, across the US uh, and libraries and community centers across the globe uh, in live pro programming. Um, from uh, these organizations. We, and this programming, by the way, has been continuing um, throughout the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, some of it's recorded, um, uh, some of it's on site, um, but it's a rich array of uh, educational resources that are available. Okay, I'll stop there, Don. Uh, that's great, Lewis, and thanks for the library plug there. Uh, you you kind of make the point that uh, about the flexibility of libraries to do programming so much in response to ideas and motivations where it's much more difficult for other institutions to uh, uh, to you know gen up things that are off uh, main program uh, I, I now realize I could have built this this uh, session 14 as high high touch meets high tech because uh, you two guys <laughs> have really exemplify that um, Lewis, you have any questions for Howard or, or vice versa? I'll go for a vice versa. Hey, Lewis, good presentation. Um, public media, which is a world that I spend about, I, I spent about 10 years running a public, two different public television operations. And we talked a lot about the use of additional television bandwidth, um, which is pretty rich. Um, in some of the spaces you're talking about, including emergency response and the like. Are you familiar with that world? Yes, I am. And uh, back in the days when um, I, I uh, was just uh, uh, an obscure researcher and professor, I did sit on a, a public media uh, 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 television board uh, in Seattle. And uh, we even started experimenting with some of the spectrum uh, back then, but there are tremendous opportunities um, as in one of the previous presentations for us to take advantage of uh, both regulated and unregulated parts of the spectrum uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, uh, folks uh, at, you know, in their homes. Um, we're looking at a couple of projects like that right now, one in the Inland Empire um, in, in a school district called the Alberti School District, which is a fascinating school district, 85% of the kids um, come from uh, low-income families uh, and they but they also I'll note have the highest graduation and some of the highest college matriculation rates of any school district in California so it's a very uh, committed uh, community and schools uh, for for uh, uh, education and we're looking at trying to put some towers on uh, school sites and uh, extend the signal to uh, to homes uh, and we're going to start working on that in the in the not too distant future, in the hopes that uh, if this is successful, we might be able to scale it to other places in the state. That uh, that starts to answer a question from Stephanie Lewis uh, to elaborate on uh, what the, your work might mean for home con connectivity. Can you elaborate a little further on that? How you see the outlook for these? extremely powerful networks to be leveraged for home connectivity. So there are, you know, there are a number of things going on, I assume, in just about every state, certainly in California and at the federal level. So many of us are spending time um, <laughs> uh, not doing the plumbing as we, as we usually do, 
but uh, uh, working with uh, public policy types and legislators. And so right now, a lot of the work is, is trying to educate people about what really is adequate um, for a household. And uh, Howard shared a, a paper that I did for the California legislature uh, on this topic. So we're, we're working on this. In California, we're likely to see a bond measure um, for broadband equity. Um, with a particular focus on um, students at home. Um, there is a tremendous amount of activity uh, in uh, Congress, uh, although not, uh, it has not, uh, the, the bills of the uh, Democrats and Republicans have not coalesced yet, but, but both parties are working on bills. Um, uh, I mean, it, it seems that just about any sentient biped uh, uh, you know, in public office now understands that uh, broadband matters and that it is uh, really a social determinant for education, for health care, for continuity of work, for opportunity, um, you know, across uh, every sector of society. So, um, you know, I, I um, you know, there's a... <laughs> There's a lot about our, our current environment um, that is um, uh, perplexing and if not frightening. This is a, an arena that gives me great hope. Um, and so folks who are out there and have contact with legislators, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to encourage them. Um, and I would encourage them to set better standards than we have. The FCC baseline standards of 25 uh, megabits down and three up just doesn't cut it. Um, we're seeing in urban areas in California, some of the up, uh, up and coming uh, ISPs able to deliver gigabit symmetrical speeds in dense urban areas at $40 a month. Um, so it is possible. Rural areas are more expensive and more complex, but we're seeing sort of a steady approach of uh, 100, 100 megabits down, 20 megs up. Um, it will require some subsidies for low-income families because it tends to be in the $100 a month range for um, that kind of access. But there's an awful lot of activity, and as I said, we need to encourage our policymakers and legislators. Uh, that's a great point. I just posted your uh, recent article, Lewis, Home and Remote Broadband Access Strategies. It's uh, I recommend it to everybody. It really breaks down the, the use cases and multiple multiple streams in an in a average household is not the circumstance that we knew just a few months ago when we were talking about what was broadband, what was needed. Uh, and thank you for your point about advocacy. Yes, we need to get on this very quickly. Uh, what, was, what was simply an embarrassment uh, for years, this so-called digital divide has become effectively a digital chasm now because of the a heavy reliance, uh, almost critical reliance that we have on connectivity these days. And you, it's a chasm you just do not want to be on the wrong side of. Uh, Lewis, you, anything that uh, Howard uh, mentioned that struck you, you wanted to ask about? You know, I, I, I thought the, uh, the interviews um, with the young people around the world um, uh, is, is just extraordinary. I, uh, I had the good, great good fortune to grow up in a, a UN family, so pretty much call everywhere home. But, you know, I, I, I would love to hear more of their views of, uh, you know, on this topic that's near and dear to my heart about uh, broadband equity and broadband access, particularly from those communities where um, there is uh, little uh, not just in their homes, but in their schools and what they think um, the adults in the world should be doing about this. It's, it's less of a critical issue for them uh, than you'd expect it to be. Um, they tend to find access somehow when they really need it. They rely much more on books. Um, they rely much more on learning from one another. They're not, they don't have this, this sort of simple addiction that we do. It's like, oh, I need to know that. Even though I'm on the phone with four other people, I'm going to type something into a web browser and learn. Like, that's just not the behavior 
um, nor is video game behavior that we seem to have amplified in the United States, for example. It's much more person to person, it's much more community, it's much more family, and it's much more where I think we in the United States are heading now because a number of our options have fallen apart. I'm gonna ask you a question. What do you think about the possibility that there is a cyber attack or some other large scale difficulty that prevents all of us from having these conversations in the midst of the political, economic, and health pandemic? Do you think that's possible or do you think it's fantasy? Well, the, the um, cyber attacks we know um, occur every second of every minute of every hour of every day. So, um, uh, you know, security is, is uh, in, in the internet world is quite a growth industry. But because the internet is a network of networks, uh, and because there's no single locus of control, uh, it's, you know, not impossible, uh, not inconceivable, but um, it, 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 it would take a uh, sophistication uh, on a scale that uh, so far uh, we haven't seen. Now, in countries where there's central control of the Internet, what you're talking about is is uh, is is uh, much more likely and much more possible. Uh, in the United States, um, that isn't the case. So, um, uh, you know, this is this is one I don't want to be proven wrong on. However, I know it's. A, I mean, to me, it's it's the very big scary scenario that you see reported on in the New York Times periodically, where there's insufficient attention being paid to infrastructure security and the likelihood that uh, you know we will if we may not lose all of global internet we, but we could very well lose through a power shortage through a a blackout through a series of rolling blackouts there's a number of ways to disable enough of the system to make all of it functionally um, absurd so uh, you know, I think about that the, a lot. We do you know, you know, school on that as well. It, it, those of us, the, those of us who, who work in this world actually are more concerned about the security of the electrical grid. Um, yeah. and, uh, and in California, um, I mean, we have the reality of, uh, you know, fire seasons that are now um, uh, year round and our own utilities um, uh, shutting off uh, power. And so it, I have to uh, admit that as someone who runs a network and we run a network operations center, it looks a little bit like air traffic control. Um, uh, you know, when the power is shut off, uh, it does create tremendous disruptions uh, in the network, but also in, with people at home running these networks, um, we're in a bit more perilous situation uh, because they're running them remotely as opposed to, uh, from secure facilities uh, with uh, various kinds of backup power. So now we, we all have uh, uh, plans uh, to, uh, if needed, to bring people back into those offices to make sure that, uh, you know, we can access the uh, redundant power supply that we have uh, to keep the network up. But it does uh, because, you know, increasingly for us, you know, that, yeah, these are great points the about the about the uh, the vulnerability to a power outage, either accidental or intentional. Uh, we just lived through one last fire season where I am, and we've just been advised that the that the power company may uh, shut off electricity in response to uh, fire danger. It's a wake up to uh, we were we were without electricity for five days, just suddenly. You know, it was look out the window, nothing's wrong, but the power is out. And uh, it, it really brings you uh, awareness of the dependency on the internet. And the cell phone was it, but the cell system itself was also undercut and overloaded. So uh, it's, a, it's a cause for communities to consider this scenario. Uh, Howard, your, your point about, or, or Lewis's point about intentional disconnections, Russia ran a test and they cut off uh, the, the country, the country's internet 
just as a test to see what would happen and how dependent they were on, on the wider world. Uh, and and this, is, this is a reasonable thing to, to prepare for. But local connectivity, there are strategies for that. We're going to get into this in the very next session on how a community might set up a, uh, a wireless, a redundant wireless network that wouldn't maybe reach everyone, depends on the size of town and network, of course, but could be hardened or, you know, self-powering and, and a local area network so that connectivity could be maintained at the local level, which is really where the communication need is greatest in a, in a, in a disaster. Not, I mean, after other than the message, of, you know, to your mom that you're okay, it's what's happening around me and who needs help, who can I give help to. We'll dive into that actually very next week. It's a great setup for it. Uh, we're running over, substantially over this week because it's such a compelling conversation. Uh, I don't really want to cut it off. Uh, so we're gonna, we usually do hang out after the hour, uh, but I think this will be a good point point to uh, stop the recording, Stephen, if you would. And again, thank you to Stephen and Ifla from Holland, who is uh, hosting the uh, Zoom call and uh, uh, helping us archive these, uh, these sessions. But we normally hang out for the, the, uh, another half an hour, which is now another 19 minutes or so for any kind of conversations. There was some interesting questions, uh, one from, uh, one was about from Janine about how to <laughs> stay in compliance with E-rate uh, uh, related to community use of subsidized networks, which is a really interesting question uh, on a couple of levels. Uh, but I would like to defer first to Lewis if you want to take a shot at the E-rate question, Lewis. I certainly have a response, but maybe you do too. So the, uh, there are us, including the schools, hospitals, library, broadband uh, 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 group, Shelby, in uh, Washington, D.C., led by John Windhausen, that have been advocating for a, a to and through kind of policy for E-rate to allow uh, the uh, uh, capacity that is subsidized to be extended uh, to uh, students in their home. And so there is some conversation about that. It, uh, it, there has, as of yet, been any action. I did happen to see, we have some E-rate experts on the call. I saw Kathy Bentham was on, on the call, who is our go-to person for, at CSM uh, for E-rate policy. We, we run a e uh, couple of E-rate consortiums in, in California for K-12 and for libraries. And, Kathy, Kathy would be the person to ask this question if she's still on. Kathy, are you still on? I also see that uh, our uh, host has is still uh, recording now. So just for everybody to be advised, we're still recording for uh, t until we hear from Kathy. So Kathy, please. Hi, can you hear me? Just fine. Oh, hi. Uh, hello, everybody. Well, I, Janine, and I know Janine very well. Uh, thanks for that question. <laughs> um, that, and that is a, 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 a great question because it's true as the, the E-rate rules currently stand, and we've heard that uh, the current administration at the FCC is really not willing to, um, or at least has the opinion that they cannot uh, change these requirements that uh, E-rate funded services can only be used on a school or library's campus. So um, anytime where you have uh, a, an initiative where there potentially could be use off campus, it's gonna require an allocation, a cost allocation of your E-rate funding request. So uh, to identify a certain percentage of, of the cost that might be uh, uh, of the broadband service that might be used uh, to serve um, students or families at home, um, that would just be deducted from the E-rate funding request uh, in order to meet those requirements as they currently stand. That's, uh, that's good. It, it, campus is, uh, is just a general term. I don't, is that actually uh, written into the language, uh, Kathy? It, the language Facility. actually says classrooms, uh, classrooms uh, for schools. Uh -huh. 
that yeah. is the language. And right. so the interpretation of the SPC has been the campus. So the, the, mm. the property, the school mm. property or the library property line is the demarcation right. point. Right, mm -hmm. right. We have an interesting uh, reply to that. There are really two levels. Libraries and schools are treated identically under E-rate, but uh, they are different uh, kinds of institutions serving in different ways. Uh, for libraries, we'll dive into this again uh, next week, but libraries are, uh, uh, they have eligible outlets as uh, bookmobiles and kiosks, which are types of annexes, which are eligible today. And what is designated as a library, a library branch, an annex, uh, uh, an outlet, is the sole discretion of the state libraries to determine what those are and certify those. You have to be part of a system, of course, but what is a, is a kiosk is the, uh, is the interesting question here. And to us, we're, we've been embracing the definition published by the Library of Michigan, which says a, a library kiosk as, uh, is in a public location, it offers Wi-Fi, no fee Wi-Fi, and it has some sort of embedded interface that doesn't require the patron to bring their own device to use it. And that's it. It doesn't have to handle physical materials the way we think of a, you know, a book drop and, uh, and all that. These really, you know, expensive and, and now uh, inappropriate kinds of, of capabilities. But having that as a, uh, as a definition, a working definition, allows setting these up pretty simply uh, and we've been advocating for this the development and deployment of these neighborhood library uh, access stations if you will uh, that should be close to everybody everybody should be able to walk or drive to uh, some place without having to go to one of the 16,000 something library facilities to sit around outside they should be able to do that. it should be extend the library on the school side it's an open question and and i think a solid one where is school? School is where the students are, and those should be defined as school and therefore eligible. Now, this is a case that, that uh, Microsoft has made in trying to reach the, those students at home. We support it. The FCC hasn't yet agreed with that. But in the case of the library kiosk, they don't have to agree because they've already set the rules out. Uh, it's still very interesting and another uh, area for, for development. It looks like Everyone is kind of understanding the importance of connectivity these days. There are a number of bills in Congress that are moving through. There's a sentiment is, is really across the, the aisle that, that we need more connectivity everywhere and pretty much everyone should have access, uh, especially now. Economic development, equity, pick your reason. Uh, it'll, it'll support that goal. I would like to now formally close the, re the recording session, Stephen, if you would. Thank everybody. Uh, and uh, if we can unmute, can everybody unmute for a minute here? We want to try to see if we can do something. Yeah, okay. Well, I'd like to thank uh, our speakers, Lewis Fox and Howard Blumenthal, for excellent, extraordinary presentations today with a round of applause. So please, everybody. We'll see that, you see how that captures on the recording. Thanks, and, and we'll see you this coming Friday, we hope.